Thanks for watching this AI Weekly Update from Henry AI Labs. This has been a really exciting week in AI and we'll cover things like DeepMind's AlphaStar paper published in Nature, uh, Microsoft's Pipe Dream distributed deep learning training framework, and then we'll cover some newly released tutorials like TensorFlow 2.0 and Hugging Face, and things like using TensorFlow Lite for this visual wake words deployed on a microcontroller. So I also recommend for following along this video to check out the uh, timestamps linked in the comments to help you, uh, you know, to filter what you want to watch and what you're interested in. Thanks for watching. This weekly update will start by looking at DeepMind's AlphaStar algorithm published in Nature this week. Grandmaster level in StarCraft 2 using multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, we'll quickly go over the model architecture used and this novel league play algorithm compared to self-play that was used to train AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero and how this differs for training the AlphaStar system. Then from Microsoft Research, we'll look at PipeDream. PipeDream, similar to Google's G-Pipe, is a system for distributed deep learning, scaling up the training to multiple GPUs with enormous data sets, and particularly this system is able to make better use of the model parallelism where you're splitting the model across of multiple uh, GPUs in order to make it so you have less idle workers, less like waiting for the data, and this kind of idea. From Google, we'll look at form to fit form to fit is an algorithm to uh, help these robots to do this idea of a, a kit assembly and disassembly where you're you know, taking the objects out of the kit and then putting them back together by having this distribution over where to uh, you know, hit it with the uh, suction cup. And then we'll look at, most interestingly, this uh, self-supervised data collection pipeline to uh, have more data for these uh, systems to be able to generalize to objects that it hasn't seen before. From TensorFlow's blog post, we'll look at this description, uh, this tutorial of how to use Hugging Face's uh, pre-trained transformer models and the pipeline for loading in the general language understanding data sets with TensorFlow data sets, and then pipelining this into the Hugging Face library. Also from TensorFlow's blog, we'll look at visual wake words with TensorFlow Lite Micro uh, using a 250 kilobyte model, uh, you know, deployed, optimized with TensorFlow Lite in order to do uh, person, not person identification. From Facebook, we'll look at the temporal data set this is a data set to make sure that these uh, action classification and videos necessarily require temporal reasoning. So compared to models where you can just classify individual frames to do video classification, these kinds of actions necessarily require you to do temporal reasoning as well. Also from Facebook, we'll look at tensor mask and improvement on the object detection uh, and an instant segmentation pipeline compared to you know, this line of faster RCNN, mask RCNN, and now tensor mask. Uh, also, we'll look at the rapid 0.10 release. Uh, discussion of a lot of cool things in data science, and then releases in Rapids, things like the uh, Rapids CUDA data frame supporting spring string types, and then we'll look at you know things like the Rapids CU spatial library and the TSNE implementation, and a lot of other cool things about Rapids. From Stanford's AI blog, we'll look at learning from my partner's actions, roles in decentralized robot teams, which is focused with these tasks where the two robots each have their own obstacles and they're trying to coordinate in order so they can, they can uh, you know, both achieve their reward of not uh, hitting the pole on the obstacles and this idea of roles to solve the problem of infinite recursion when you're taking your, uh, you know, your collaborator's action into your own to condition your own state observation and your own policy mapping. Uh, from Kaggle, we'll look at the new TensorFlow 2.0 question answering challenge. Uh, this idea where you have these uh, Wikipedia articles and you're searching for the answer for a question in a given Wikipedia article. From MIT, we'll look at self-transforming robot blocks, jump, spin, flip, and identify each other. Uh, this is an improvement on the previous system because now these blocks are able to communicate with each other, which I think is really interesting for you know, the development of reinforcement learning agents and all sorts of different things in AI. Uh, also from MIT, we'll look at this OmniPush data set, Pushy Robots Learn the Fundamentals of Object Manipulation. Basically, this is a data set where you have different kind of mass distributions and different uh, you know, outer surfaces of these objects. And the data set is basically pushing these uh, objects with a robot arm such that a system could learn what the future video frame of the pushing might be, you know, given a novel object and a novel mass distribution on the object. Also from MIT, we're looking at recovering lost dimensions of images and video. A really interesting motivating example is this idea of going from two-dimensional x-rays back into recovering the depth information for something like a three-dimensional CAT scan, a CT scan. So it's a really interesting article, uh, this idea of using variational autoencoders to recover lost dimensions in compressed representation formats. Uh, from Berkeley, we're also looking at Looked and Listen, pre-learning environment representations for data-efficient neural instruction following. Uh, this is a really interesting autoencoder framework in order to map the visual world with natural language instructions for different tasks and a system just to make this uh, you know, process of natural language instruction for visual world manipulation more tractable. We'll look at the recently released Keras Tuner. This is probably the easiest way to get started with hyperparameter optimization, AutoML, using Keras through this kind of interface. 
Uh, from Google's AI blog, we'll look at the schema guided dialogue data set for conversational assistance, a way in order to structure the construction of these data sets for uh, virtual assistants, uh, conversational chatbots that have to do tasks like order me a pizza or you know schedule a haircut or something like that. Also from Google's AI blog, we'll look at on-device captioning with live caption, uh, the model used, and then how they use TensorFlow Lite in order to optimize and deploy this model. Uh, also from Google, we'll look at Google at ICCV 2019, a really great computer vision conference that recently concluded, and some of the research papers presented by Google. And we'll also look at uh, this list from Papers with Code of the different papers at ICCV that have uh, open source their code implementations of the research papers. From Weights and Biases, we'll look at Introduction to Hyperparameter Sweeps, a model battle royale to find the best model in three steps. Now, this is a great article showing some of the different, uh, you know, features that you have with the uh, Weights and Biases framework in order to do AutoML searching for different hyperparameters. Uh, from Intel, we'll look at Sequence Me, uh, discussion on uh, using genome data to fight cancer, and sort of a uh, discussion around uh, demanding more patients' requests to have their uh, you know, genome sequenced and tested for these kinds of things. Also from Intel's AI blog, we'll look at AI interns making a difference at Intel. Uh, this blog post goes through different projects that are being done by AI, uh, interns at Intel AI to give you a sense of you know, what kind of projects you might work on if you decide to you know, take this route and look at this kind of opportunity. From NVIDIA's AI and Deep Learning blog, we'll look at new GPU optimized models and notebooks available from TensorFlow Hub. So these are some models that have been announced at the TensorFlow World Conference, some UNET models and BERT question answering inference with mixed precision uh, that you can use with the TensorFlow Hub interface. I will also look at a latest addition to NVIDIA's uh, interactive demos, the Ganimals, where you upload a uh, pet, a dog, I think, and then you uh, outline the head and then it translates it, this uh, facial expression into other animals. I will also look at uh, NVIDIA's discussion of how automatic mixed precision uh, reduces the training time for the Galgan model, this kind of uh, sketch to photorealistic image from 21 days to 13 days. Uh, then we'll look at uh, this application of how computer vision can help customer service by avoiding kind of waiting in the phones by just taking a picture of the uh, deformed product or whatever the issue is and then just using the computer vision model to help filter you through the uh, you know kind of like the call waiting pipeline. Uh, so then we'll look at this article from NVIDIA how AI is reinventing the retail industry. Uh, it goes through a lot of different applications and different cases things like you know chatbots to doing like retail with computer vision and then to things like demand forecasting with rapids. Uh, then we'll look at also from AI uh, NVIDIA AI uh, looking at uh, this application of detecting weeds in agriculture and probably really interestingly in this article is their use of really high resolution images. Uh, we'll also look at this description of different startups in NVIDIA's inception incubator. Particularly these three startups are working on sort of these platforms for machine learning and deep learning. Things like uh, helping with continual learning and then things like uh, these drag and drop interfaces for building neural networks. Uh, also, we'll look at how uh, NVIDIA describes this AI system that's used to uh, judge uh, gymnastics competitions. Uh, we'll look at some of the research NVIDIA has presented at ICCV, such as MetaSim, a technique for uh, improving generating uh, synthetic data sets that are used for downstream tasks, things like uh, you know, the content, particularly in the uh, synthetic data. Also from NVIDIA research at ICCV, we'll look at this article on generating city road layouts by having these aerial images that we then transfer into these kinds of uh, roadmaps. Also from NVIDIA, we'll look at this uh, different AI companies, uh, deep learning applications in healthcare, things like, uh, you know, making sense of these kinds of like uh, smartphone and smartwatch data, as well as a lot of different startups looking at improving uh, medical imaging. And then we'll conclude this episode of the AI Weekly Update with this week's edition of The Batch from Andrew Ang and DeepLearning.ai. DeepMind has published an update about the reinforcing learning StarCraft II playing system Alpha Star in Nature this week. Some of the interesting updates are obviously the architecture, the policy network that they use, the actor critic uh, learning algorithm that they deploy, and then also this idea of league play compared to self play. So StarCraft II is an interesting game. I've never really played it, so I can't really give you much of a detail about it. Uh, it's a real-time strategy game. Uh, they detail how there are three different races, each of which sort of uh, are like a very different style of playing the game. And then they uh, discuss also how they have like a rate limit on how many actions the reinforcement learning system is able to make. So it can't just exploit the computer's ability to make like a million actions per second or something like that. That would make it grandmaster level without uh, real, you know, strategy. I highly recommend checking out the summary from Yannick Kilcher, Alpha Star Grandmaster Level in StarCraft II using multi-agent reinforced learning. In this video, uh, Yannick goes through the paper and he provides a lot of really interesting annotation and markups to help you interpret this paper. So this image right here that I've paused is on his description of the league play compared to self-play. 
So we have the uh, different kinds of uh, agents. There are the uh, main agents, the exploiters, and the league exploiters. So this diagram shows how the uh, main agents are playing against previous versions of themselves. The uh, main exploiters are uh, agents that are trained just to try to uh, be adversarial with respect to this one opponent, and the league is sort of has this other perspective of looking at the uh, set of agents trained on the different, uh, you know, the different uh, races. So it's a really great video summarizing this. I highly recommend checking it out. This is the paper published in Nature, uh, Grandmaster Level in StarCraft 2. You can access it by going through the DeepMind blog post, and then that'll take you to the Nature article. Unfortunately, you can't save it. If you try to save it, it'll tell me that I'm just uh, using this uh, share it access method, and I can't uh, download it. So kind of scrolling through, this is going to be a little bit of la a little bit laggy. So uh, they start with the paper. They have these really cool images showing you different things, like the supervised learning that they use this imitation learning system that is learning to copy the actions of the human players and then they show you the uh, chart of showing the performance and so this is around the level that the supervised learning imitation learning on the human experts is able to achieve and then they show you obviously you know all the nuances and the updated algorithm is able to achieve much better than that so they show you their reinforced learning diagram and they show you this uh, diagram of the league play algorithm which is different from the self play used in AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero and I recommend checking out uh, Yannick Kilcher's description of this, it's really good for understanding this idea of league play. So uh, towards the end around, uh, or around page 4 they have these ablation studies where they show you the performance differences and the miscellaneous uh, you know, tricks and the things proposed in the paper and then around uh, page 13 they show you their uh, architecture, the, net, the network for the learning algorithm so it would be a little laggy because of the interface. Okay, so they have the uh, baseline features. They use a train the value network in this kind of actor critic learning type of algorithm. And then they have the uh, scalar features, entities, minimap. These are miscellaneous characteristics of the StarCraft game. The minimap, some kind of indication of where the different units are. Uh, StarCraft is this kind of game where you have like these workers and you have to like allocate them to do different tasks. And it's, you know, adversarial game. And so you're like building things and then sending them to attack. At least that's kind of how I understand I don't play the game, but that's kind of like the high-level overview of the game that I've come to understand. So then also, really interestingly in the network is this LSTM layer. This is used to encode the memory of the previous actions to inform the agent on the future. Uh, definitely a really interesting architecture. They have these different uh, decoders for the action. Uh, really interesting. Microsoft's research blog has published an update about PipeDream, a more effective way to train deep neural networks using pipeline parallelism. So pipeline parallelism is different from these ideas of model and data parallelism. So in data parallelism shown here, you have uh, different subsets of the data that you'll pass off to different workers that each hold a copy of the neural network. Then they will uh, compute you know, the forward propagation and then the back propagation and they'll send it to maybe like a centralized server that's holding the weights. They'll go fetch the new uh, version of the weights maybe you know, synchronously or asynchronously and then they will train the models in this way. Model parallelism would be where you're distributing the model across, uh, you know, across multiple GPUs. So this can be a bit tricky for programmers because you have to figure out how you're going to distribute your model across multiple GPUs. And so that's kind of the problem that uh, PipeDream is looking to solve. It's looking to both improve the efficiency of having, you know, idle workers with this kind of uh, model parallelism, and it's also looking to make an interface so it's easier for programmers to define their models and then have them parallelized in this way. So another interesting uh, study sort of on model parallelism is Megatron language model. Uh, this is a case of scaling up a language model to something like, I think it's like, uh, you know, more than 10 billion parameters for a transformer language model. And the key is that they're using this novel model parallelism technique. So pipeline parallelism, uh, it's this idea of the key idea is that they're trying to uh, reduce wasting the time where like the so you partition the uh, model across different workers and if you imagine passing some data through uh, you know a forward pass and a backward pass you have a lot of these workers that have computed their part of the model and then are just kind of waiting for the you know gradients to come back but the idea of having this uh, inner batch pipeline is that you can just keep passing data through it to reduce the idle time so another interesting comparison uh, from Jesus Rodriguez uh, posted in Towards Data Science is a comparison of Google's G-Pipe uh, distributed training system compared to this new uh, Pipe Dream uh, from uh, Microsoft. It isn't quite new, it's a, project, it's a part of this uh, Project Fiddle, which is uh, Microsoft research and fast and efficient infrastructure for distributed deep learning. And you can also check out the GitHub repository for Pipe Dream if you're interested in learning more about this. From TensorFlow's blog post is Hugging Face, state-of-the-art natural language processing in 10 lines of TensorFlow 2.0. So Hugging Face is this really cool library. Uh, they have pre-trained transformer language models like GPT-2, BERT, uh, Distilbert, Roberta, these kinds of models that have been pre-trained. And this article is going to show you how easy it is to get this to run in 10 lines of code in TensorFlow 2.0. So the beginning of the article starts off by describing how you use pip install transformers. 
you know, previously you could only use it in PyTorch, now it's been extended to TensorFlow 2.0. So the Transformers library from Hugging Face is built on these three classes, uh, configuration, tokenizer, and model, if you want to get more of the details of it. But for our case, we just look originally at how you can uh, import the model, the pre-trained weights, and the tokenizer used for the model. The tokenizer is this idea of how you convert the strings and the text into these integers that are mapped to the vocabulary. So you see how if you want to do BERT, all you have to do is just tf BERT model from pre-trained, BERT tokenizer dot pre -pre uh, from pre-trained, compared to GPT-2, same kind of interface, really easy to just you know switch out the different language models if you want to do this kind of testing with them. Uh, so then they're discussing how to fine tune a transformer model. You know, if you're interested, you've got some text data and you've got a task, you want to, you know, use this Hugging Face Transformer model for your task. So they start off by showing you how to build an input pipeline, particularly by using these uh, TensorFlow data sets. So you can come to TensorFlow's documentation and see the TensorFlow data sets. They have a lot of really cool uh, data sets that you can just easily load into this interface, you know, particularly for like academic kind of research, you know, things like these different image data sets like Caltech, BIRDS, uh, things like CIFAR-10, all this kind of stuff. And then, so in text, we're looking at the general language understanding, you know, glue. More particularly, we're looking at the Microsoft Research Paraphrase Corpus, which is this, uh, you know, 5.8 thousand pairs of sentences, and you're basically classifying them whether the, you know, different sentences have the same semantic equivalence. So this is part of the general language understanding project, and you can check out this paper if you want to learn more about this. So this is how you load in the uh, general language understanding Microsoft Research Paraphrase Corpus and how you pipeline it to prepare it for the TensorFlow 2.0, uh, particularly the Keras uh, model.fit method. So now that you've created your data pipeline, you uh, define your optimizer, you define your loss, you define the metric that you want to track, then you compile the BERT model from that you've preloaded from the Hugging Face library, and then you just BERT model.fit, and it's as easy as that to fine tune these uh, transformer language models. So particularly, they show you these are probably the, you know, the 10 lines of code headline, this really concise uh, summarization of load in the BERT model, uh, you know, pipe, prepare the data, uh, define the optimizer loss metric, compile it, and then, you know, fit the model. So it's a really great, uh, really educational article, really cool seeing this Hugging Face Transformer library and the development of it, uh, definitely a really cool thing, and uh, the adaptation to TensorFlow 2.0 is really cool as well. TensorFlow's blog has published a really interesting article on visual wake words with TensorFlow Lite Micro. So the idea behind this is similar to how the Google Assistant is woken up when you say, OK, Google. Uh, this vision model is going to be woken up when it sees a person in the frame. So the idea is that the vision model has a very simple task. Well, not super simple, but just a binary classification of person, not person in the frame. And then the key idea with this uh, challenge, the TensorFlow Lite Micro, is that you're going to deploy it on a microcontroller. So microcontrollers, they have very limited memory. Uh, shown here 100 to uh, 320 kilobytes SRAM and you know really small flash storage as well. So the idea is that they've got to build this model that can achieve high accuracy on person, not person detection, or just binary you know image classification, but by having a model size that's less than 250 kilobytes, peak memory usage less than 250 kilobytes, and then inference cost is less than 60 million multiply ads per inference. So there's a lot of interesting talks on this. You can uh, see the paper, visual wake words data set, and then from the IEEE conference, uh, particularly, uh, you can do the Visual Wake Words Challenge or Efficient Deep Learning. And if you click on them, you will get to see the full talk, which is really interesting, I think. So to get an idea, uh, this is an example of one of the systems built. Uh, you can see walking by the thing, person detected, compared to no person detected on the model embedded in this device. And uh, so really interestingly, they achieved 94.5, 95%, extremely memory limited, 250 kilobyte models. So this is interesting, the optimization uh, with uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro. So you can uh, go to the TensorFlow Optimized Machine Learning to learn more about this, things like pruning, quantization, uh, miscellaneous things that are used to deploy models and edge devices to do things like uh, microcontroller image recognition. So you can also go through the repository of TensorFlow Lite Micro and a tutorial on getting started with uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro. AutoML is one of the hottest areas of deep learning right now. Everyone is looking to squeeze more performance out of their model by automating their hyperparameter tuning. So you don't want to be sitting in front of your model, uh, you know, waiting for it to finish training so that you can just manually adjust the learning rate, the number of hidden layers in your network, and things like this. So this is introducing Keras Tuner, a new library on top of TensorFlow 2.0 that runs with Keras. And this is, in my opinion, the easiest way to get started with uh, hyperparameter tuning and AutoML with deep learning systems like image classifiers, you know, natural language processing, these kinds of things. So look at this interface. You just install the Keras Tuner. You import the Keras Tuner. You currently have access to random search and hyperband. Random search, you just randomly search through the different hyperparameters you define. 
hyperband, you have this technique of doing like non-uniform resource allocation in order to more strategically search through the different hyperparameters. So then using this interface with the Keras tuner, you define the, you know, hp.int, and then you define the different values, like the min value is 32 and the max is 512 for the number of hidden units in this dense, fully connected layer. And then you also see how you define things like the different values of the learning rate, and then you will just pass it to this uh, random search API to fit the model. So, and then you get this kind of interface with the search space summary, a really cool interface, and I definitely recommend checking this out if you want to get started with hyperparameter, uh, you know, optimization and auto ML in the absolute easiest way possible to do this. From Facebook's AI blog is the temporal data set, a benchmark for recognizing actions in videos. So this isn't a new data set, rather it's an algorithm that can be on top of things like the DeepMind Kinetics data set or the something something data set, which is a technique for making it so the video data and the action classes necessarily require the model to have temporal understanding. So an example of this in their research paper, Only Time Can Tell, discovering temporal data for temporal modeling, is actions such as sneezing, yawning, or crying, where you have to have a temporal sense of it in order to classify it. So this is different from a lot of video classification methods that just look at individual frames. So you break a video down into say 30 frames per second, and then you just run classifying decisions on the individual frames, and that would be how you would parse the video. So in this data set, they describe the technique to uh, extract the 50 temporal action classes and resulting in 34.5K uh, videos from the DeepMind Kinetics and something something data sets. So what they're doing is they take apart the uh, video and then they scramble the frames and see if the humans can still tell us. So say the label is playing the guitar, you could take the 30 frames per the second in the playing the guitar clip and then scramble them around and you would still be able to tell that the label is playing the guitar. But if it's something like sneezing, crying, or yawning, and you take apart the 30 frames, scramble them around, the human can no longer classify the video, and therefore this would uh, you know, pass the requirements to be a part of this uh, temporal data set, a benchmark for making sure that these uh, video classification models have to do temporal reasoning. And you know, the structure of temporal reasoning is described as the shuffling of the frames that uh, you know, this is the you know, criterion that says an action class requires temporal understanding compared to an action class that you can just classify individual frames and ignore the uh, temporal change in the uh, frames. So I'd like to relate this concept of the temporal data set from Facebook with a video I recently made, uh, Slam Dunk Video Classification. So in this case, in this tutorial, I take you through uh, extracting out the video frames and then using it in order to classify, to crop out the dunks from the full uh, tape. So in this case, all you need is to do single frame classification. You don't need to do temporal information. But to just further describe this concept of requiring temporal data or temporal information would be if, say, instead of just cropping out the different dunks, you had to label the dunks. So, uh, you know, there's different kinds of dunks. You can do like a 360 off the backboard, a windmill, you know, different kinds of dunks. And even though individual frames might be, you know, enabling enough to classify the uh, video, it's sort of starting to give you an idea of the difference between just doing person, not person in the frame, you know, things like the visual wake words, to compare to things like where you need this temporal information in order to understand the flow of motion in the, uh, in the video data. At ICCV, Facebook has presented a new instance segmentation technique called Tensor Mask. So Tensor Mask is different from Mask RCNN and uh, things like Faster RCNN in that it's doing the, uh, the segmentation in one forward pass. So rather than having two separate pipelines of bounding box detection and then the like refinement of the segmentation mask, Tensor Mask has uh, integrated this into one end-to-end -end pipeline. So I recommend checking out this article from Analytics Video to get a sense of the, you know, the progression of these object detection models, things like uh, Faster RCNN, uh, the, the difference between semantic and instant segmentation, and then up to the uh, mask RCNN model. I, st I found the tensor mask paper is a little difficult to read, and I, I don't totally understand it completely, but I think the high-level idea is that it's, uh, you know, cutting out the uh, pipelining from bounding box to segmentation mask, and this novel architecture that just does it end-to-end. -end. From Google's AI blog, we have Learning to Assemble and to Generalize from Self-Supervised Disassembly, a paper called Form to Fit. You can check out their uh, page for the project, Form to Fit, Learning Shape Priors for Generalized Assembly. So the task that they're doing here is the robot arm is learning to uh, place the objects, take them out of a kit, and then put them back into the kit. So it's got these modules that are uh, applying these heat maps over where to put the uh, suction cup on the robot arm to pick up the object, and then it's got these uh, modules for where it wants to place the uh, object in the uh, kits. So really interestingly is the, uh, 
introduction of this self-supervised data collection. They're repeatedly uh, disassembling and reassembling the kit in order to build enough uh, data in order to do this. So also interestingly is this idea of generalized assembly, being able to assemble with any kind of objects. So they have this really diverse data set and they're using this kind of matching network with the place and the suction in order to train this model in order to take apart kits and put it back together and to be able to generalize to novel objects. So I think somewhere in this they cite that they have uh, an accuracy of about uh, like 86% when they are tasked with novel objects compared to 94% with the uh, training validation set. From Stanford's AI blog is learning from my partner's actions, roles in decentralized robot teams. So this is probably best illustrated with this example where the two robots have this metal rod and they got to place it on the ground, but they each have like an obstacle that they want to avoid when they're placing the uh, rod on the ground and they have to uh, rotate the rod in order to avoid the obstacles. So you see this demonstrated here. Uh, both robots are trying to push the, pot, uh, the rod sort of in opposite directions so they haven't quite uh, coordinated well enough in order to avoid both their obstacles. But again, this robot is only uh, aware of its immediate obstacle. It doesn't know about these books that the other robot is dealing with as for this robot. So the idea, the high level idea presented in this article is this idea of how if you are interpreting the other uh, agent's actions in your uh, state representation, basically you have this kind of infinite recursion shown here where basically your policy is conditioned on the other agent's uh, action, which is conditioned on your action. So you have this infinite recursion of uh, conditioning your policy on the other agent's actions and on and on and on. So they introduce this idea of roles where uh, one robot is speaking and the other is listening in order to interpret the action that the robot is making so that when the robot A or A sub 1 is pushing the rod out to the left to avoid the box, this robot will stop acting and understand the action taken by the other robot in order to interpret what kind of uh, what it might see, what obstacles are available to it, and then it can adjust its action. So it's an interesting idea of introducing roles in order to have these kind of uh, collaborative robotic systems. Rapids' Medium blog has published a great article about Rapids 0.10 and then Things We Love Inspired by Decades of Data Science. So they're introducing a lot of new additions to the Rapids libraries, things like the CUDF, CUML, and CU Graph. Also things like CU Spatial is new to Rapids in the 0.10 release. Uh, they start off the article by discussing the ecosystem of data science, you know, what's inspiring the build of Rapids, uh, improvements to Pandas with the CUDF, you know, CUDA data frames. So was, there's a lot of things to go through in this article, a lot of new additions, a lot of people uh, with their testimonies about why they like using Rapids. Uh, some of the things that I'm most excited for, uh, the string data type support in the CUDF, and then also the uh, TSNE speed up. I'm not sure exactly where that is in the article, but there's a lot to check out in this article. Uh, CU graph, the CU spatial, I think has just been released. Uh, a lot of really interesting stuff around Rapids. Definitely something I'm keeping my eye on and you know looking to learn more about. MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab published about pushy robots learning the fundamentals of object manipulation. So what's happening in this uh, data set that they've constructed is they've got this robot arm that's pushing these different kinds of uh, you know, shapes of the objects with different kinds of master distributions as well. So the objects can have different kinds of orientations. You see uh, circular all the way, uh, then compared to this object that has these triangle faces, uh, triangle, things like the concave uh, faces. So there's these different kinds of shapes, and then they also have different uh, mass distributions on the, uh, you know, different locations of the weights on these little objects that are kind of changing the mass distribution of the object. So what's happening is the uh, robot is pushing it, and they're recording the future video frames as the robot pushes it to have a sense of friction and, you know, what might the future frames be if you apply this amount of force at this location on this object. So you can see from their research paper, OmniPush, accurate, diverse, real-world data set of pushing dynamics with uh, RGBD video. Uh, so you can see this idea that they're trying to uh, predict the future frames when the robot is pushing the uh, different objects with different mass different shapes, different mass distributions in order to have a sense of what might happen if I push this object. Because uh, with robotic manipulation, they say a lot of applications that you can use by having a sense of uh, pushing, you know, friction, and this idea of where the object will be in the future if you push it here with this much force. So the data set OmniPush, it has 250 different pushes, 250 different objects, you know, configured in uh, this kind of way with these different kinds of uh, uh, faces. And then it, the data set consists of 62.5 thousand unique pushes. From MIT's uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab blog is recovering lost dimensions of images and videos. 
So in the article, they discuss uh, about how commonly images are compressed into these two-dimensional flat representations, uh, sacrificing either the three-dimensional depth information or the uh, temporal information, which you could also say would be a third dimension of this kind of data. So some of the really interesting uh, things in this uh, blog post, the research that they're discussing, is things like uh, resynthesizing the hidden dimension you know, in the moving MNIST data set, which you can check out. Uh, in the link in the video, or you can go to the uh, Toronto University's computer science and go to unsupervised video data set. So they're able to uh, recover this uh, temporal information from the uh, still two-dimensional image frames. So something else that I thought was interesting as well is this idea of having these two-dimensional x-rays and trying to reconstruct three-dimensional CT scans from the x-rays. So they're uncovering this depth information from the two-dimensional scan, and they're doing this by using these... Uh, I think it's in this, but they're doing this by doing this uh, variational autoencoder system of going from, uh, say, X-ray to CT scan with the labeled data, and then using that uh, variational autoencoder for inference about how a given X-ray might correspond to the three-dimensional, you know, with the depth information CT scan. Also from MIT's computer science and AI lab is self-transforming robot blocks jump, spin, flip, and identify each other. So this uh, blog post research study. It has yet to use like deep learning and you know this kind of AI that generally is studied in this kind of video, but I just think it's really interesting. So the key idea here is that now the blocks are able to communicate with each other compared to the previous study where they had these robots that can self-assemble by you know throwing the mass in the middle of the cube in order to self-assemble it into different rotations. Now the idea is using this, uh, I think it's also a different kind of manipulation for the way the blocks move but they're also able to communicate. So you could imagine building reinforcement learning systems, deep learning systems that are trained to optimize sort of the hive of the cubes because they are communicating with each other and they can have this kind of like, uh, you know, interface as an agent. Berkeley's AI Research Lab has posted a really interesting blog post about data efficient neural instruction following. So the blog is titled, Looked and Listened, Pre-Learning Environment Representations for Data Efficient Neural Instruction Following. So I'm going to motivate this as an example of uh, this paper, Follow Net Robot Navigation by Following Natural Language Directions with Deep Reinforcement Learning. So one example of this would be, say you're uh, in like a virtual reality tour of a house, and you might want to give the, uh, you know, the camera system that's navigating the house natural language instructions, like walk down the hallway and take a left, or uh, you know, let's see the bathroom, things like this that you want to use to navigate through the house and then have the reinforcement learning agent able to uh, you know, map the vision of the house, you know, how you would go about walking down the hallway and turning left with your natural language instruction to it. So the idea presented in the uh, Berkeley uh, blog post is they're focused on this task where you're doing the cube stacking. I can see the paper from this learning language games through interaction where you're telling it to do things like stack a red block on the leftmost block. So it has to attribute the visual world with the natural language instruction. So what they're doing in their paper is they're presenting this technique to use an autoencoder that is encoding the, uh, the visual world before the action compared to after the action. And they're using this in order to kind of cluster together uh, similar visual re representations. So when you say something like uh, put the block on the left, it has a more uh, tractable search space compared to all the possible options that you could possibly mean when you say put a block on the left corresponding with the visual world if it doesn't really understand kind of the current action to next action. Uh, or current observation to next observation uh, transition. So it's a really interesting uh, autoencoder system, definitely something worth checking out and learning more about this kind of uh, you know, visual language navigation. TensorFlow 2.0 question answering is a really cool new competition on Kaggle. So basically the idea is open domain question answering. So compared to previous models that are looking at short paragraphs to try to extract the answer to a question, this is looking at uh, longer articles. So particularly you're given a Wikipedia article and then a question at which, of which the answer is contained in that Wikipedia article. So this is inspired by the Google Natural, Coin, uh, Natural Questions data set. And you can see examples of this by scrolling through this, like uh, asking a question like when are hops added to the brewing process and then watching how you might uh, navigate the Wikipedia article to find the answer. So something I thought was interesting too about this is just kind of this idea of open domain questions. I think sort of the article that we covered last week from the Stanford AI blog is sort of seeing open domain as if you had all of the Wikipedia articles for every question compared to this competition where you at least you know which Wikipedia article the answer is in compared to having to search through the entire corpus. So that's kind of my, more my, do, my definition of open domain compared to closed domain, but still definitely uh, you know challenging to do and a really interesting uh, competition.
With the recent conclusion of the International Conference of Computer Vision in South Korea, you can read some of the different papers that uh, Google has published at ICCV, uh, Facebook has published a similar list of these papers, and you can also go to things like NVIDIA has published some of the papers, or you can just go through the paper list if you just want to, you know, regardless of the company that's published the paper, to see a list of different papers. But it's definitely an interesting list of different papers. You can also come to Papers with Code and type ICCV 20, 2019 and see some of the different models like searching for mobile net v3 where they have the uh, you know where they publish the code as well as the research paper and there's a long list of these different papers that have been published in this conference that also have the code available so if you're interested in learning about google research at iccv i recommend checking out this video i've made google research at iccv i just uh, you know go through the 41 different papers they've published and just give like a two second overview of like what it's about and i've done a similar video about uh, facebook's research at iccv if you're interested in this kind of uh, you know high level overview report google's ai blog describes a system to do on device captioning with live captions so the idea is that when you have these videos uh, to get the uh, you know the transcription the text of the audio in the uh, video and to do this in near real time so basically the idea, you know, you're on a train or something as described in the video, you're watching this video and then you're in some crowded area and you'd like to have the text so you can keep watching the video. So the model that they use is really interesting. They have this pipeline between the sound events recognition, like how you might see like in the brackets, like laughter and then the text. Then they combine this with the automatic speech recognition system and they have this, you know, language punctuation kind of model to, you know, format the text in order to have these kinds of captions. So it's really interesting, probably another really interesting detail is this TensorFlow Lite runtime. So similar to the TensorFlow Lite Micro where you can uh, you know, do things like the visual wake words challenge on you know, microcontrollers, the TensorFlow Lite runtime is another way to enable you to be able to do something like live captioning, automatic speech recognition, sound event recognition on the mobile phone, and then to be able to do it about four times a second as they describe in the article as well. From Google's AI blog is introducing the schema guided dialogue data set for conversational assistance. So this paper is discussing how you have these uh, Google assistants, virtual assistants that have to deal with uh, conversations across a large variety of domains. So particularly they have 18,000 dialogues spanning over 17 domains. An example would be the difference between, uh, you know, calling to order a pizza compared to, say, uh, scheduling a hair appointment or something like this. So in the paper, you can also see more about it in this uh, Medium post from Christopher Dossman discussing uh, the schema guided dialogue data set. And so now we'll look at the research paper toward scalable multi-domain conversational agents, the schema guided dialogue data set. So I think the key idea in this is that you see how they have this schema for structuring the construction of these data sets by having sort of an SQL like engine, you know, service slots and tents and using this in order to build the constructions of these multi-domain, uh, you know, dialogue data sets. So you can also check out the GitHub repository, uh, guided dialogue state tracking. And then this is going to be presented in the AAAI uh, 2020 conference, February 7th to the 12th. So I'd expect to see, you know, more about this towards the time of that conference and, you know, definitely an interesting opportunity if you're, you know, if this is kind of where your research is. From Weights and Biases is an article, Introduction to Hyperparameter Sweeps, a Model Battle Royale to Find the Best Model in Three Steps. So we looked previously at Keras Tuner, which is probably the easiest way to do hyperparameter optimization, but the Weights and Biases interface provides you with a much better visualization of the uh, hyperparameter search. So one cool example of this uh, detailed in the article is how you see how these yellow lines correspond to the hyperparameter configurations that led to the best accuracy. And it's just a really cool interface, uh, weights and biases. I high rec highly recommend checking it out. Uh, you can see this article is going through the different hyperparameters used to uh, classify the different Simpsons characters in different frames. And you can see how you have the, uh, you know, the visualization of the different hyperparameters. And you also have the media tab where you can visualize the different predictions on different instances. You know, obviously you can use this on whichever data set you want. Uh, definitely a really interesting interface and a great article just for showing you some of the different things you have access to in this system. AI interns making a difference at Intel from Intel's AI blog describes some of the different projects that interns at Intel's AI lab are working on. So I think it's a really great description of things. If you're looking at Intel, you know, looking to see what kinds of projects you might be able to work on here, it's a great list of different projects that people are already working on so you can kind of get an idea of this. So this first project describes a collaborative evolutionary reinforcement learning and research on this. Uh, you know, the different papers that have been published, different applications like, you know, prosthetics and these kinds of things. Uh, then you see the system, the homomorphic encryption, privacy preserving kind of algorithms. Uh, this idea of improving the labels used to train image classifiers, uh, natural language processing research, 
and then you know another privacy preserving application so it's a great article if you want to get into depth of any more of these things and see kind of what you might be working on if you were to try to you know take this route and look into an AI internship at Intel. Also from Intel's AI blog is Sequence Me, how AI for good can empower patients to fight cancer differently. So the article describes uh, using genome testing in order to you know try to identify mutations that are responsible for different kinds of cancers and a discussion of this campaign of Sequence Me to try to get more people to try to you know request genomic sequencing and to kind of fight with the healthcare providers to you know include this more definitely a really interesting thing worth looking more into from nvidia's ai and deep learning blog is a discussion on new gpu optimized models and notebooks available from tensorflow hub google ai hub and uh, google collab that were presented at the tensorflow world conference so you look at the unit models and notebooks you go to tensorflow hub uh, nvidia has published this and they have different uh, units so if you load the tensorflow hub Basically, it has this interface where you import TensorFlow hub as hub, and then hub.module, and now you have the UNet, and then it just shows you how to process your images to format them for the UNet semantic segmentation model. And then so also they have a BERT question answering inference with mixed precision. Uh, we'll talk about more about this automatic mixed precision algorithm they're proposing in at the next blog post. But so you go to the AI hub, uh, you can see the BERT question answering interface to use this kind of pre-trained model with the hub, you know, using it for inference for question answering. And then uh, you see a little bit of a discussion uh, about the mixed precision training where they're switching between, you know, 16 bit and 32 bit floating points and they see this three times overall speed up. And so definitely an interesting article about the different kinds of uh, models that you have access to at the uh, TensorFlow hub. AI's latest adventure turns pets into ganimals is the latest edition of N NVIDIA's uh, live interaction demos of different uh, research models. So this is an interactive demo of their research paper, Few Shot Unsupervised Image to Image Translation. So most interestingly, you know, you just upload one image and then it's able to do this kind of translation. So Few Shot, really interesting application. So you see how you upload a picture of a dog, your own dog, and then you highlight the head and then it translates the same facial expression onto different other kinds of animals like bears and tigers, these miscellaneous things. And they, you know, describe applications and things like, you know, making movies and translating the dog's action into something like a tiger and this kind of thing. So I had a shot with this, uploading a picture of Henry, founder CEO of Henry AI Labs, highlighting his face and then using the interactive demo to translate Henry's face onto these other different pets just to show you an idea of, you know, what this is and kind of the idea of translating the facial expression. You know, it's there's definitely a lot of noise in it. It's not like completely successful, but... It's still interesting, sort of, you see how they're all like centered in the middle. They have a similar facial expression. It's not like completely perfect, but still interesting. Automatic mixed precision helps NVIDIA Galgan researchers dramatically speed up their deep learning training is a discussion of how this uh, system of switching from 32-bit floating points to 16-bit floating points is able to reduce the training time for this Galgan of converting this sketch into a photorealistic image from 21 days to 13 days. So in the article, they also have a lot of links to looking at mixed precision. So this article, Automatic Mixed Precision for NVIDIA Tensor Core Architecture and TensorFlow, it gives you the general overview of this idea of switching between 16-bit floating points and 32-bit floating points in order to have more efficient training. And then it takes you through a walkthrough of doing this with, uh, you know, training a ResNet 50. So you can also look at a more detailed uh, description, the Deep Learning SDK, talking about mixed precision training, you know, switching between these two different data types. And then you can also look at the Automatic Mixed Precision for Deep Learning, where they show you the interface for TensorFlow, uh, the interface for PyTorch, and then MXNet as well. So a really cool idea, this idea of mixed precision, things like quantization, you know, really interesting seeing it too in uh, training, not just inference, but we're looking at mixed precision with training, switching between, you know, uh, lower bit, 16 bit in training as well, which I think is different from a lot of these uh, blog posts and research that's looking at quantization and sort of accelerating inference with this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of trick. This blog post from NVIDIA's AI blog is about Inception, NVIDIA's startup incubator, and different startups that have presented at TensorFlow World 2019. So particularly the three uh, Inception startups that are presented here are about kind of having these platforms for deep learning and di different things. So the cnvrg.io is a system for uh, continual machine learning. You know, how does your model react to having new data? Uh, you also see things like Determined uh, AI, a system for abstracting things like distributed training, hyperparameter optimization, and architecture search. And then you have uh, Percepti Labs, which is one of these, uh, you know, drag and drop interfaces for building neural networks. Uh, definitely really interesting to look into this uh, NVIDIA Inception Startup Incubator. 
and cool to see these different developments of these platforms that are trying to make it easier to build out these deep learning, machine learning models, deploy them, you know, optimize them, and all these different things. So you can check out all their websites, uh, cnvrg.io, uh, uh, Determined AI, the you know, infrastructure, and then Percepti Labs, sort of this drag and drop build a neural network interface. Another great paper from NVIDIA Research at ICCV is MetaSim, Learning to Generate Synthetic Datasets. So we've seen a lot of papers recently about bridging the sim to real uh, training distribution gap, papers like you know, OpenAI's Rubik's Cube, automatic domain randomization, and a lot of these different papers that are looking at how you bridge the synthetic to real, sort of like the visual data distribution. Well, this paper, MetaSim, Learning to Generate Synthetic Datasets, is concerned primarily with the content in the synthetic data and how well this kind of content translates compared to just kind of like the style of the, uh, you know, the synthetic visual data and how the style differs and causes a domain transition gap. So this uh, content distribution system, uh, really interesting. They detail how they're learning to refine the content of the simulation in order to perform, uh, improve the performance for downstream tasks. And again, really great. They have a little video to explain it. A uh, really awesome blog post. In video research at ICCV, generating new city road layouts with AI is a really just interesting paper. Uh, generating road layouts for different city styles. You see um, road networks like New York City compared to London, and how they're uh, mapping these kinds of uh, you know biases with the city and conditioning this with respect to the aerial maps that they find. Also, really great with the blog post is a uh, you know a video explaining sort of the paper. Uh, you know, neural turtle graphics for modeling city road layouts. And it's really great to just have the kind of video that gives you an overview if you're more interested in this research. How AI is Reinventing the Retail Industry is an interesting uh, paper summarizing different applications of AI deep learning to retail. You can also check out NVIDIA's uh, Driving Intelligent Retail with AI, where they go through different kinds of applications as well, each one kind of going through in more detail about each of the different applications. So in this blog post, they discuss things like, you know, how conversational AI is used, how computer vision systems can help with like stocking and you know, store analysis. They discuss things like how uh, Timberland used this kind of monitoring of, you know, like a hotspot heat map of where the customers are by doing probably some kind of detection. And then they discuss, you know, how Walmart uses Rapids in order to accelerate these machine learning algorithms that are doing this kind of like demand prediction. So really interesting, also cool to see, you know, applications of Rapids, a great video I recommend using, uh, watching. And there's also, you know, more description just generally about how you know, different areas that, you know, GPU technology, AI deep learning is applied into retail applications. Bumper Crop of AI Helps Farmers Whack Weeds Pesticide Use is an interesting article about applications of computer vision models in order to detect weeds in these kinds of, uh, you know, agriculture applications. So it's sort of similar to this article, uh, Weights and Biases Challenge of Aerial Segmentation with Drone Deploy, where you have these aerial images and then you're looking to detect weeds. So it's really cool uh, discussing their system, a lot of the details of it, you know, such as like the accuracy for different tasks, and then other things like how they're sort of an interesting detail, particularly to this article, is that they're using really high resolution images, particularly they discuss using 36 uh, megapixel images, and then they say that they think even further having higher resolution would boost the performance of the networks. So I thought that that was probably the most interesting detail, in addition to just, you know, more education about different kinds of applications that are being, uh, you know, deployed and used. Also from NVIDIA's AI blog is an AI system used at Gymnastics World Championships to help judges with scoring. So it's interesting to think about these kind of, uh, you know, pose estimation, uh, the depth of 3D models that are able to, you know, look at the pose estimation and sort of automatically judge the, uh, you know, the execution of these different gymnastic moves. Uh, definitely a really interesting AI system. Picture-perfect product help AI startup brings computer vision to customer service is an interesting startup that has been on NVIDIA's AI podcast to discuss their product. So basically the idea is that instead of the having to go through these customer support hotlines, you can use computer vision to take a picture of the defective product and then send this directly to the manufacturer with you know a better kind of routing to the uh, service based on the interpretation of the picture from the computer vision model. AI gold seen in healthcare's mountain of waste is an article describing different healthcare companies that are using AI deep learning in order to improve different things. So from this list, you see things like uh, BioTrillion, which is a technique to use digital biomarkers to detect disease, things like sensor data from you know, smartphones and smartwatches. Uh, then a lot of these startups on this list, things like Subtle Medical, Inform AI, are things that are using uh, you know, deep learning on medical imaging. You saw how uh, last week Subtle uh, MR got the FDA clearance for doing the uh, denoising for the MRI imaging. So there's a lot of uh, really cool startups to check out in this list and uh, talks about uh, you know, uh, imaging informatics in medicine and different kinds of ways 
AI is being used in healthcare, as well as a link to a book, uh, Deep Medicine, How AI is Changing the Healthcare Industry. This week's edition of The Batch is a Halloween-themed discussion of some of the main headline concerns about AI, you know, mainly in popular media. So the first one discussed, you know, will AI, you know, take over and can humanity be destroyed by its own creation? Uh, discussion from The Batch about things like, you know, different, uh, you know, analysis of them, talking about AGI and different things. Uh, the next topic is, uh, you know, deep fakes. What is the damage of deep fakes going to be? Uh, you know, surveillance using computer vision to track your face and movements and concern about this. You know, things like biased data, you know, bias in the data that's used to train the deep learning models and a lot of research that's done to try to prevent bias in AI. Uh, you know, the age to old discussion of will AI take everyone's job and then, you know, this AI winter and, you know, this kind of thing that's happened before and worries about, you know, inflating this bubble, this hype about AI and having it crash and, you know, cause sort of a recession with the AI research and investing. Thanks for watching this AI weekly update from Henry AI Labs. Please subscribe for more deep learning and AI videos.